I'm about to proclaim the only message of eternal life, that Christ was crucified for sinners, that He actually endured a severe punishment in order that we could come and have peace with God. And really this Christmas season, we're celebrating the Prince of Peace, the one who was truly God and truly man, God incarnate, the one who's created all things and upholds the universe by the word of His power, has come to make a way of salvation. In John 3, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and He talks about the nature of the new birth and the need to be born again. He teaches that you must be born again. That if, unless one is born again, he is not able to see the kingdom of God. And he has this statement where he says, No one has descended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Now this is Jesus Christ, the one who has always existed, the one who is from everlasting to everlasting, the true and living God. He has come, entered into time, entered into history, so he descended into heaven. And at this point, no one else had ascended into heaven, no one else had gone to heaven because Christ had to die to secure salvation. All those Old Testament saints, they were justified by faith and they were saved, but they needed to be released from Hades through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so in verse 14 it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. We could say it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up. This is of an utmost necessity so that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. So Christ Jesus, He was lifted up. He's the Son of Man that was prophesied in Daniel 7. The Son of Man who would be riding on the clouds of heaven and He would go up to the Ancient of Days prophesying the ascension of Jesus Christ and to him would be presented a kingdom, glory, dominion, where all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. And Christ says he is the Son of Man and he will be lifted up in the same way that the bronze serpent in the wilderness had to be lifted up. Now, what exactly is Jesus talking about? If you don't know your Old Testament history, you don't understand the significance of this, that this is a very significant moment in the ministry of Christ in which he is talking about this bronze serpent. So the, the Israelites, they had been delivered from their bondage of slavery. They had been delivered from this Pharaoh, this bondage in Egypt, and they were complaining to God. It says that the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. So this is an amazing reality. They were poisoned because of their sin, and if they would look to the bronze serpent, they would be free from their poison and have life. And what Jesus is saying is that in the same way that the rebellious Israelites had to look to the bronze serpent so that they could be free from their poison and have life, he's saying you too must look to the Christ who was high and lifted up, the one who was crucified for sinners, the one who defeated death, hell, and the grave, that if you would look to him, you would have life. You would be free from your bondage bondage of sin in the same way as the rebellious Israelites was free were free from their bondage in Egypt you could be free from your bondage of sin and have life looking to Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before us endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God so we must look to the one who is the author of salvation we must look to the God who is mighty and able to save completely he is able to save to the uttermost. See, if you would come to Christ, if you would draw near to God, He will draw near to you and He will cleanse you of all of your sins and all of your unrighteousness. Christ, He lives as the faithful high priest in the heavenly temple to intercede on behalf of the ungodly. Have you come to trust in the intercessor? Have you come to trust in the Christ who died for the ungodly? You see, if we have a faithful word, a trustworthy saying that Jesus Christ came to the world to save sinners, what sin would be so important to you that you would toss up everlasting life with your Creator? See, there's no sin worthy of, uh, amen, no sin is worthy of tossing up your soul. What will it profit you if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? And so we are called to look to the Christ who is high and lifted up.
The scriptures say that they were surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses that we should lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely to us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So throw aside your sin. Don't hold on to your sin. Don't cling to your sin, but cling to Jesus Christ. Christ lived a sinless life. And all the things that you have failed in, Christ prevailed in. And you're lying, you're stealing, you're blasphemy. Christ never did any of those things. See, we have a sympathetic, sinless Savior. And based on this sympathetic, sinless Savior, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace and receive mercy and grace to help in our time of need. After Christ lived that sinless life, he went to the cross and he died. Why? Why did Christ have to die to bring about salvation? Well, the scripture says that the soul who sins shall die. It says that the wage of sin is death. But Christ, he never sinned in word, thought, or deed. But he became the legal representative of all sin on the cross. He became sin who knew no sin. So that in him, we might become the righteous of God. So Christ, he dies on the cross, and then he emerges from the grave. He defeats death, hell, and the grave. He sanctified the grave. Because if he's the author of life, then the pangs of death could not hold him. So he defeats death, hell, and the grave. So that if we would have faith in him, we could be seen as if we lived his righteousness life even though we haven't you see my verdict ought to be guilty but in Christ my verdict is not guilty and if you would call upon the name of the Lord that would be the verdict for you as well your verdict would be therefore now no condemnation if you would be found in Christ Jesus you see we have the doctrine of union with Christ if you have come to trust in Christ and you've been crucified with Christ the Apostle Paul says I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who lives but Christ who lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So if you come to trust in Jesus, then that old man that once loved sin and hated God will be crucified with Christ on the cross. You will be united in his death, burial, and resurrection. So that if Christ has died and you've come to trust in him, then your old sins and your old man is buried in the grave. And if Christ has been raised up to newness of life, defeating death, then you too would spiritually rise from the grave. And of course, on the last day, there's coming a day in which those who trust in Christ will also raise physically from the grave. The inaugural, the, the consummation, rather, of the new heavens and the new earth, you see. For God so loved the world, we could say God loved the world in this way. It's not dealing with the quantity in which God loved the world, but the quality, you see. It's the quality, the manner in which, this is how we would translate the Greek, the word hutos. In, for God loved the world in this way, in this manner that he gave his only son, that all the believing in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so are you one that has the continuous action of belief? Have you looked to the Christ who is high and lifted up for sinners? Jesus Christ said, for this is the will of my Father, in order that everyone who looks to the Son and believes on him should have eternal life and I'll raise it up on the last day. So today, you can look to Christ. You can turn away from your sins. You can trust in the Christ who died for sinners, who died for the ungodly, and you would be granted the gift of everlasting, everlasting life. See, you don't have to perish. If you would believe on Christ, you will not perish in your sins, but rather you will have life and have life abundantly. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He says no one comes to the Father except through me. See, except for Jesus, we would have no way to the Father because only Jesus was righteous. And in order for us to stand in the presence of the thrice holy God, we must be perfect. And this is why Christ said, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. But we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So how is this perfect righteousness attained? How is it that we can stand before God as perfectly righteous? Well, the means by which we can receive that righteousness as a gift is through faith in Jesus Christ. Again, he became sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might behold the righteousness, become the righteous of God, you see. The Apostle Paul said, For we hold that as man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And so today, you can have faith in Jesus. You can have faith in Christ. It's, it's apart from works of the law. It's not because you're a good person. You can't be saved because of your good deeds. You see, if you think that you can be saved because of your good deeds, well, that is a rejection of the grace of God. That's a nullification of what Christ accomplished on the cross. And this is why the Apostle Paul says, I do not reject the grace of God for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. There had been no reason for Christ to have died. 
Christ said he did not come to call the righteous. He didn't come to call those who think that they're good people. He came to call sinners to repentance. He's the great physician who is able to heal the sick, who is able to mend the brokenhearted, who is able to take dead sinners and make them come to newness of life. And that's what God does. It says, but God being rich in mercy, because of the great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you are being saved. And so that's ultimately what we're here to proclaim. The free gift of God's grace that is offered through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, through the death, burial, and resurrection. Now you can receive a free gift of grace. You can be seen as if you live the righteous life of Christ because Christ laid down his life. The wage of sin is death. Christ laid down his life. He paid the wage of sin in the place of all who would believe in him and the free gift of God's eternal life through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, you see. So we now have this free gift of grace that we can receive. And again, it's not based on our works because if it was based on our works, we would have something to boast about in the presence of God. And that is essentially idolatry, and that is the idolatry of every Christless religion in the world. If you have a Christless religion, it can't save you. Only Christ can save because he is the exclusive way to the Father. And again, he's the only one who ever lived a sinless life. God would be unjust to forgive anyone who is not clothed in a perfect righteousness. God cannot look upon a single sin. And this is why we must hide in the righteous robes of Jesus. We must take refuge in Jesus Christ, trusting in him. Today, if you would call upon the name of of the Lord. Your life can be hidden with Christ on high. And so I pray that you would hide in Jesus, that you would get in the ark. The ark is typological of the reality of Christ. You see, the ark was in the, in the flood and the people hid in the ark. They hid from the wrath of God. And the scriptures tell us that the one believing in the Son has eternal life, but the one disobeying the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So you can hide in Jesus. You can take refuge in his righteous robes. You can get in the ark and flee from the wrath to come. This is good news, my friends, that even though we're sinners and we deserve nothing from God, we deserve no mercy, but yet he shows mercy, and the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. God is a faithful God, and he can save you completely from your sins. All that the Father gives him will come to him, and whoever comes to him, he will never, never cast out. But you must come. You must repent in order for you to receive the benefits of the atonement, in order for you to receive everlasting life. No, thank you. In order for you to receive everlasting life, you must call upon the name of the Lord, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's a divine passive. You will be saved. It is God who does the saving. He's the one who grants salvation. We are merely recipients of that salvation. We are merely recipients of his grace. God is the one who gets all the glory. All glory goes to God. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen.